We were fairly deep in chapter 4 of uh, 1 Corinthians when we ended on May 19th, which, as I said, has been a couple of weeks ago. I want to briefly <coughs> review or bring us back up to date of where we were. You remember when he started 1 Corinthians, he pretty quickly got into this problem of people denominating themselves according to which teacher uh, they tended to follow. Um, this, this is very much uh, denominationalism is what it is. The people were saying, you know, I'm better than you because Peter taught me, or I'm better than you because Paul taught me, or I'm better than you because, you know, um, Apollos taught me. And some people would, would come up and go, well, I was taught by Christ, which, you know, can be just as bad if you, if you treat yourself as superior to other people when you say that. Um, and he is scolding them for that, sometimes rather sarcastically and scathingly. Um, he is um, telling them that they're not operating according to the spirit, that they need to be more spiritual in their thinking and more receiving of each other. Um, and he, um, and if you go down to verse, uh, late in verse 6 of chapter 4, he says, uh, if you don't go beyond what's written, then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us over against the other. So that, that line right there makes it really, really clear. Everybody was prideful of the fact that their teacher or the person who baptized them was somebody special in some way. Um, that's, he says that's, that's not what you should be doing. Um, Verse 7, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? In other words, you didn't do it yourself. You received it. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? You know, self-made man thing. There's no such thing really as a self-made man. There are always other people who help you along. Usually a very strong woman somewhere in the background <laughs> who helped you along. But no one does their life totally on their own. Uh, and these people did not become Christians totally on their own. Other people helped them. It was, it was their decision, but they did not do all of that. They did not know everything before someone came to them. They, um, it, it's, it's like when you're born smart. Okay, you had nothing to do with that, so don't be so prideful about it. You know, you were lucky to get born smart. Well, if you're born too smart, you're kind of unlucky, but um, but if you were born smart or good looking or, or strong and athletic or whatever your special characteristic is, you didn't cause that. You were born that way. Uh, and this is kind of how he's talking here. You didn't really cause this yourself. Um, in fact, something President Obama said several years ago actually has a grain of truth in it, even though I disagree with the statement. He was talking about people who start businesses, and he said, you didn't do that you had to have the help of other people. I think that's what he was trying to say, but he just chose his words badly. <laughs> when you start a business, you may have the basic idea and the drive and the impetus to do it, but you can't do it without help. Of course, you may be the person who goes out and gets that help and everything, but it takes, it takes more than one person to accomplish great things like that, usually. Um, and that's sort of what he's saying right here. You didn't you weren't born a Christian, and even if you were, you still weren't, can't be puffed up and proud over it. Um, so, uh, and then he uh, goes into verse 8 of chapter 4, and he starts his sarcasm. He says, already you have all you want, already you have become rich, you've begun to reign, and that without us, you did it even without us, how I wish, and here he switches back, how I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. Captives of war would come back with, with the army that had captured them in, in the Roman times, and the general would ride in the front on a big white horse or something, and people would be praising him, and all the soldiers would be behind him and everything, and then the captives that were going to be probably either enslaved or put to death and were in chains were coming along at the back of the procession. So he's describing himself as if he were a prisoner of war 
in a battle that had been lost. By the way, I, I don't know if it's absolutely true or not, but there was always, some, but it said that there was always somebody right beside, either in the chariot or on a horse near the, the general who's going into town saying something to the effect of glory is fleeting, fame is fleeting. In other words, don't get too proud. They, I think I've heard that that was said, that they would. Uh, but anyway, he says, we're at the back of the procession like people uh, destined for the arena or condemned to die. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. Now he really gets sarcastic. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We're in rags, are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. He was a tent maker. He supported himself. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. That's where we ended two weeks ago. I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. He quite often refers to his converts as his children, uh, particularly Timothy. He refers to Timothy as my son. Um, and, and there was probably much more of a father-son relationship there since he was quite a bit older than Timothy. But he also often refers to the people that he had preached to and converted as his children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I'm going to have to move that down a little bit more. Therefore... I urge you to imitate me. Now, some people have claimed he's being uh, arrogant here about, I, I urge you to imitate me. He's just talked about what he's like, you know, what's going on in his life. He, he doesn't think of himself as all that great. In fact, in another place, he says, I'm, I'm the, the, the top sinner. You know, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Um, but he says here, I want you to imitate my life. And in another place, I completely forgot to look it up. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Christ. So that, that's really what he means there. Uh, I urge you, therefore, to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, here we go, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life, which he's just described, in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. He's trying really, really hard to get these people to become less prideful and arrogant and more humble. And, and humble doesn't mean weak any more than meek means, meek, means weak. Um, humble means not wrapped up in yourself is kind of what that means. Not wrapped up in your own things. You're, you're more wrapped up in, in other people getting the glory. And uh, you, can, you see this a lot in management. Uh, on management teams. There'll be one manager that everything that gets done in, in his or her department, they take credit for it. And the people, and they, they can take some credit for it, but they take credit for it. The ideas become their ideas. And then you have the manager who is always pointing out who had the good idea and who did good work and, and not pointing to themselves so much. That's humility. Now, when you point at, at other people doing good things. You know, we've always said when you point at somebody doing bad, uh, how many fingers are pointing back at you? You've heard that? When you point at somebody who's doing good things, those same fingers are pointing back to you. So it works both ways here. If you're always looking for the good in other people, they will see good in you when you do that. And so looking, guess what happens when you look for the bad in other people? <laughs> you find it <laughs> for sure, don't you? And guess what? They find it in you immediately for that. So it, it, it works both ways, whether you're looking for good or bad. I had an interesting experience last night, and it's not a, it's not a proper example of what I'm talking about, but it, was, it, it pleased me a great deal. We went to Habaneros, which is out on Interstate 75 on the far side of Clinton with Paula and Joe Tackett, and I order a la carte. I don't order the beans and rice. And so I ordered a taco and a tamale. 
when my plate arrived, I had a tamale and a beef enchilada. And I thought, hmm, I like beef enchiladas. I think I'll just eat it. I could have gotten mad, couldn't I, and sent it back. <laughs> As I was eating along, I realized that the enchilada made the tamale even better because there's not a lot of meat in, an in, a, in a tamale. And so when the guy came, I said, we had a happy accident, and I explained to him what was going on, and he started to look concerned. I said, don't be concerned. I'm happy. I'm glad that this happened. That's a tiny, tiny example, and it's trivial, but it, how many people do you know where say, you brought me the wrong food, take this back, you know? Um, I learned as a child, my father taught me, he actually owned restaurants from, on occasion early in my childhood. My father said, if you're, when your food comes, if they bring you the wrong thing, and you like that and can eat it, eat it. <laughs> Don't be a complainer. You know, if you ordered a, uh, you know, a, a, a steak and they brought you ground beef and you like ground beef just as much as you like steak, take it, you know, because it's going to take them 10 minutes to bring you another steak and everybody else is going to be done eating by the time you get yours. So you, it's going to inconvenience you if you don't. But anyway, look for the good, especially in other people. Look for the good. <clears throat> um, okay, he said, imitate me. Uh, verse 18, some of you, he, he said this a couple times already, I guess, in one way or another. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon. This is a threat. But I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power the implication being none. Um, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love with a gentle spirit? That's a threat. He viewed himself as capable of pouncing on them. I mean, he was an apostle. In fact, in one place he says that. Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord? You know, he, he is an apostle. He has a right to be rather authoritarian, and sometimes he does it because people are just not listening. Oh, he's just Paul. You know, he's, he's just that old short, bald-headed man that doesn't talk very well. He writes pretty good, but he doesn't. He doesn't he's, not a good, he, he's not a Billy Graham, you know, or an Apollos or anybody like that. He's just not that good a preacher. So we're not going to pay any attention to him. He says, I'm, I'm going to come. And he says, it won't be a matter of talk. We'll see who's... Do you remember... Is it, is it Elijah or Jeremiah that does the fire? It's Elijah that, that challenges the, the prophets of Baal. And he says, okay, we're, we've talked enough here. Let's see whose God is the most powerful here. And he says, let's put out some altars. And he put out an altar, and they put a dead bull on it. And he said, okay, go get Baal to, you know, set your, your uh, sacrifice on fire. And the priest got out and danced around and screamed and hollered all day and cut themselves with knives, and, of course, nothing happened. And then Elijah comes out and says, I want you to dig a hole, a ditch around the thing, and I want you to start pouring water on the, on the sacrifice. And when the ditch is full of water, in other words, they have soaked the sacrifice to death with water. Some people said it was naphtha. It's water, I'm sorry. Um, he says, okay, now, and he goes, and God goes, boom, you know, that's a demonstration of the difference between talk and power. Paul had power. He could talk, but talk, you've heard the saying, talk is cheap. You know, it's easy and, and you hear this a lot. You know, they ought to do so-and-so down there at Highland View. Who is they? Are you part of this family? I hope so. And that makes you they. Um, not many people criticize the landscape around here because they know I'm kind of, kind of, sort of halfway in, in responsible for it. You know what happens to somebody who comes up and doesn't, doesn't help me when they come up to me and they say, Joe, you, know, you need to do so-and-so. 
I go, thank you for volunteering. I appreciate that so much. Here, let me give you a key to the shed. You can just work all you want to. After one or two of those, they don't say anything anymore. Now, there are a number of people, Phil and Alva, for example, who do things without me even asking them to. Phil, just about every Sunday, blows off the walkway out here because those magnolia leaves and pods are just everywhere. And Jim Roper works. Various other people work in the landscape. They're, uh, the, the heart, uh, we always call them the heart ladies. <laughs> That's not um, the sisters. Uh, they work in it. They don't even ask me sometimes. They can say anything they want. Joe, you need to do something. Yes, ma'am. I'll take care of that immediately <laughs> because they're participants in it. Uh, what was it Levi said a year or two ago? Those who are riding in the cart shouldn't criticize those who are pulling the cart. If you're pulling the cart, okay, you can criticize how the cart's pulled, okay? But if you're riding in the cart, you shouldn't criticize those pulling the cart, okay? When you get out and start helping to pull, now you can criticize a little bit if you want to. But you still need to be careful about that. Remember, we are supposed to do our part. We're supposed to pull the cart together. And the only people who should be riding in the cart are the people who cannot pull the cart. And the people who cannot pull the cart should be cheering us on or making lunch <laughs> or something, you know, <laughs> whatever you can do in the cart. Um, and whatever it is, some people are unable to do anything but ride in the cart. That's all they can do. God bless them. I'll look back if I'm pulling and go, that makes me feel good to know that I'm, I'm pulling that person. And they're smiling and they're happy to be in the cart. And that may be all they can do. Some of our members are bedridden and just about all they can do is exist for us. And that's enough in their case. But many of us are retired and reasonably healthy. We have time on our hands. Those of us who are not reasonably healthy, we still have time on our hands, but there's not a lot we can do with it. But if, you have, if you're retired and have time on your hands and you're reasonably healthy, you you're wasting yourself if you're not helping the family here in some fashion. If you don't do anything but write Christmas, oh, Christmas cards, if you don't do anything but write birthday and anniversary cards to people or call people up on the phone when, when you know they're sick or, or encourage people. And again, just showing up here can be an encouragement to people. Just showing up. Now, if you're capable of doing more than that, you should. But just being with the family, and this is going to come up here in, in a minute. Um, later we may not get to it today but it's going to come up later um, so he basically starting in verse 18 through verse 21 he's, it's, it's sort of like what mama used to say just wait till your father gets home <laughs> remember that just wait till your father gets home oh please God let him die in a car accident <laughs> Boy, no I would never say that but please let him work late <laughs> you know so I can be in bed asleep just wait till your father gets home. And that's sort of what he's saying here. Just wait till I get there. We'll see, we'll see what's going on. We'll, we'll, we'll straighten this thing out one way or another. So at the end of chapter 4, he pretty much stops with that issue of arrogance over who your teacher was and how you're better than another person who was baptized by Peter. Or Oh, I, I thought I heard somebody asking a question. It's talking to you. Oh, okay. Every, that happens to all of us. Uh, I got a two minute and 40 second uh, uh, voicemail from Tyra the other day, and there was not a thing on it, just, just muffled sounds. Um, that's why I use a flip phone. You can't make, you know, accidental calls there with those things. It happens. So he, he has essentially finished with this subject of being arrogant over who your teacher in Christ was. And in chapter 5, and I guess we're going to make it into it, he begins with a new issue that is, I guess everything that happens in the family is kind of related in some fashion, but this looks like a completely new issue, a new subject. Uh, and he starts right in on it. It is actually reported, remember he's finished with the, with the arrogance thing, 
it is act, although they're still going to be arrogant here. It's actually reported that there is fornication among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man has his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit... Now notice what the, the goal here is. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. By the way, that day of the Lord, I think they've translated that properly. He's not talking about Sunday. It's the day of the Lord, which we've talked about before. They viewed marriage as in a somewhat different way than we do today. Uh, I don't know that one is better than the other, but they were different for sure. But anyway, it looks like this man, it doesn't say that his father had died, and it doesn't say that he had married the woman. So I'm guessing that he had stolen his father's wife, his, step, his stepmother, and, and was then living with her. So that's, that's pretty raw. And um, he says, you're, you're proud of your, your um, liberal view of this. Well, he... He doesn't like that at all. And he says, uh, hand this man, in verse 5, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, it turns out that they actually did do this. They, what we call, withdrew fellowship from him. And in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, it appears it worked because he says, you need to forgive this guy now and bring him back into the family lest he be overcome with sorrow. So it apparently worked. Now, the question is, why did it work? The sin is just a sin. Why did what they did matter to this guy? Today, we don't do it. We have kind of tried to use this as a formula for doing things, but we do it totally wrong. When somebody quits coming to Highland View, well, I don't think we've done this in a long time, Johnny. Um, at least I don't know of any. Uh, when somebody is, is complacent in their attendance, I mean, just that, you know, for a period of time, and they don't come. I can remember our, the elders would send them a letter disfellowshipping them. What is that? They already disfellowshipped themselves. They're not part of us anymore. You, sending them a letter is kind of like closing the barn door after the horse is gone, you know. They're gone. This man wanted to stay in the fellowship. And when they shunned him, he missed something that was more valuable to him than his mistress. What was it? If the church withdrew from me for whatever reason, I believe I would quit whatever I was doing because I would miss what's going on more than I would whatever it was I was doing wrong. This is not a place you just come on Sunday. This is a family. And we need to be a family of people looking out after each other, taking care of each other, supporting each other. If, if, have you ever run into people who are not churched and not anything? They're basically alone in the world. That's why we have a lot of clubs and things because people think that will make them feel like they belong. Um, but... When, when people are sick in our family, food gets prepared for the family. Or if there's a death in the family. There is support and there's concern. When there are financial or emotional or physical or other kind of setbacks, 
we're supposed to step in. And I've kind of gotten used to that. I'm not sure I would know what that would be like if I didn't have you. I, I don't know what that would be like. I would, uh, Tyra, I don't know where Tyra would be if it weren't for you, Joanne. Remember? <laughs> Years ago. Um, Tyra just literally came apart at the seams. I think it was hormonal or something. She had had a hysterectomy a month or two before, and she just went bat crazy, you know. And I was in New Mexico. Joe was right there. What if she hadn't had somebody like that? I don't know. But I kind of take that for granted now. I, I don't give it second thought. We look after each other. You don't want to lose that. You really don't. Uh, I sure don't want to lose it. Um, but this man saw the value of having fellowship with the other Christians in Corinth. He recognized it. And he stopped what he was doing. And they were still kind of shunning him. And Paul says, don't do that. Take him back. You don't, don't have him overcome with sorrow over what he's done. He needs your encouragement and your forgiveness and he needs to be back in the fellowship there's there are things going on in in a good fellowship that we don't even know about and I'm not talking about stuff that's just secret I'm talking about spiritual things that are going on between us you make me I know it's a hard job but you make me a better more spiritual person whether I want it or not you help me in that regard. And I don't always realize it. So this man missed what he had in the fellowship. They shunned him. He stopped what he was doing. And we find out in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, that Paul says, take him back, forgive him, encourage him, bring him, bring him back up into the family. He's, he's, he's okay now. So bring him back. Um, so uh, in verse 9, I'm going to just probably read a little bit, but I won't have much to say. Uh, verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter, so he's apparently written a first 1 Corinthians before this 1 Corinthians. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with, uh, NIV says sexually immoral people, the uh, King James says fornicators, uh, probably fornicators is a better translation, but it means the same thing. Uh, that you not associate with those kinds of people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral. In other words, I'm not talking about people out in the world. I'm talking about people in the family. Oh, nor of the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world to get away from all of that. But now I'm writing to you, so I wrote to you before, now I'm writing to you again. This is the second letter already, even though we call it 1 Corinthians, at least the second. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but who is immoral or greedy, an idolater, slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler, and I guess similar types of things. He says, do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? we don't. Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Um, and so they do. Uh, and that's the end of chapter one, uh, 5. So he spends that entire chapter uh, talking about this particular problem. And this... And, and people go through and they're well, well, what do we do about this kind of sin? What do we do about that kind of sin? These are blatant, obvious sins. People who are living a life of sin. This is not a person who is trying to do the right thing and, uh, and periodically makes a mistake, okay? Everybody makes mistakes. Uh, let me rephrase that. Everybody sins. We, we say mistakes and that kind of minimizes it. It's both a mistake and a sin. We all do that. But if you look at a person's heart and they are a greedy person and that is their style of life is greed or idolatry and we, we don't have the kind of idols they used to have but we do have cell phones, we have TVs, we have cars, we have houses, we have boats, we have all of these jewelry, 
we have all of these things that become so important sometimes to us that they become our idols. We do obeisance to them. If you spend more money on HBO or, or television than you do on things of the Lord, where is your priority? I mean, I like a nice TV and I like having cable, but, you know, if I've got a $12,000 television and you can still get those, <laughs> if I have a $12,000 uh, television and a, and, a, and a theater in my home and every kind of CD and DVD player and DVR and, and all these other things and I'm attached to every movie thing in the world and I've got just tons and tons of money in, in that, but yet I'm not really that affected by what's going on in the church. What's my idol? It's obvious. If I spend all of my time out buffing and polishing my Mercedes Benz and I never have time to do anything for the Lord, what's my idol? Who am I worshiping here? So he's saying these are, these are clear and present ways of life that people have that make them really unworthy to be part of the family. And remember, he said many, many, many times, you need to live a worthy life. You need to be striving to do good things. Do good things. Be a servant of the Lord. And nobody's going to do that perfectly. Nobody. Everybody's going to mess up. I've even been known to say the wrong thing to people on rare occasions, on about a daily basis. Um, that's part of my sin is my inability to I can really be condescending and arrogant you've heard me say that before I can really be condescending and I hate it every time I do it but I do it and I thank God that most of you forgive me for that it's not my intent but that that's one of my problems that I can be really arrogant at times and or, or condescending whatever term you want to use so he says and he's going to go into this a little bit more in chapter 6 about not judging people outside the church versus judging people in the church. Um, and so we'll take that up next week. But um, he's, he's going to actually go into that in some detail in chapter 6 because they were doing some things they shouldn't have been doing with regard to judging and, and, and dealing with one another. But he says, you can't get away from immoral people outside the church. It's just going to be everywhere. So he's not talking about that. He's only talking about relationships inside the family on that. So we'll take up with, uh, with chapter 6 next week. Um, let's see. May God give you the grace and the willingness to be an active part of the family and to see the value of being a part of his family. Christ our Lord.